Hi, welcome to this presentation screencast. Uh, my name is Barry McMullen from Dublin City University. I'm also affiliated with Antashka, the National Trust for Ireland. This is an extended version of a presentation first given on Friday the 9th of March 2018 at the Nuclear Free Local Authority All-Ireland Forum Spring Energy Policy Seminar in Oma, Northern Ireland. And my title is, Where is the Low Carbon Energy Vision Ireland Needs to Mitigate Climate Change and How Can It Be Delivered? As I mentioned, uh, my primary academic affiliation is with Dublin City University, where uh, I'm an electrical engineer. I'm in the School of Electronic Engineering in the university. I'm also a member and a past chair of the Antashka Climate Change Committee. Antashka is the National Trust for Ireland, one of the longest standing environmental NGOs in Ireland. But I will just mention that everything I'm going to say in this presentation is in a personal capacity and is not on behalf of and doesn't necessarily represent policy on behalf of Antashka. The title was the one suggested to me by the conference organisers and I'm very grateful to them for giving me the opportunity to speak to this. I will just um, question somewhat the low carbon terminology, but we'll get to that in due course. Okay. So, for context, we need to talk about why decarbonisation or low carbon energy systems is an issue at all. There are a number of reasons why we want to decarbonise energy, but the single most dominant one is the issue of climate change. So let's try and get climate change <coughs> out of the way, as it were, at the start. So, thankfully, last year, or conveniently last year, in the US, there was a very major academic science report running to 600 pages assessing the state of climate science and the implications for public policy. Uh, and even more helpfully, one of the co-authors, climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe, summarised the entire 600 page report in one tweet. It's real, it's us, it's serious, and the window of time to prevent dangerous impacts is closing fast. And if you take nothing else away from my discussion of climate change climate change and climate science um, but those messages then you'll be doing pretty well but let's just briefly unpack them anyway so climate change is real um, this can be represented in various ways but um, particularly like this temperature reconstruction <coughs> going back essentially to the depths of the last ice age so at that time global average surface temperature was approximately three, three and a bit uh, centigrade degrees below the average in the last uh, 10 to 12,000 years. That is to say, below the point, uh, the level at which the entirety of human organized civilization, settled civilization based on agriculture, large scale city based uh, civilization, uh, the entirety of that has happened while temperature has been in this region. The ice age was about three degrees um, below that, three uh, Celsius degrees below that. Uh, we have an instrumental record for recent temperatures, which is this blue uh, part of the chart here, uh, and also uh, the red part. And that basically shows that there has been a very sudden abrupt spike upwards in global temperatures, which is histor in historical terms quite unprecedented. So yes, there is natural variation in global climate and in temperature, but this is not natural. This is the fingerprint of human activity, and you can see it dates from roughly the 1800s, 17, 1800s, from the Industrial Revolution, from the exploitation of fossil fuels, and the release of carbon dioxide from fossil fuel combustion at progressively greater and greater scales. This origin, orange line is a projection of the trajectory that the global temperature is on if we continue uh, with our current extremely high rate of emissions affecting the global uh, atmosphere. And that would place us easily three degrees above uh, the average over this period of human civilization. Uh, and the only point of, of showing this slide is to say that during the depths of the last glaciation, uh, this was essentially a different planet, a planet not especially hospitable to human civilization. This planet up here will also be inhospitable 
um, it'll be a different planet. But the time scale of change is so rapid that our ability to adjust is extremely limited. So far and away, while it is important to make preparations for these changes insofar as we can and try to adapt to them, uh, if it goes on anything like this trajectory, it will be beyond uh, managed adaptation. So it's critically important that we get off that trajectory, that we don't allow the temperature to go up at that rate. So it is real. Uh, the science is very well understood. The underlying physics is well understood. It is us. We understand that carbon dioxide, though a dilute gas in the atmosphere, is a greenhouse gas. Uh, it affects the energy balance, the inflow and outflow uh, of electromagnetic radiation, light and heat, from the sun and then onward to deep space. Uh, so it, it modulates that balance and the temperature is essentially a result of that modulation. And we know from the basic science of carbon dioxide and the basic science of the atmosphere and the energy balance that it plays a very significant role. And even though in absolute terms it's in low concentration in the atmosphere, the change, pre-industrial it was about 280 parts per million, we're already up over 400 parts per million, um, and that changes down to us. This little wiggle that you see is the superimposed annual carbon cycle. So in the northern hemisphere summer, where there's more land area, we get more plant growth, that draws down carbon dioxide, in, in, and so the concentration in the atmosphere goes down. Northern hemisphere uh, winter, trees lose leaves and so forth. Uh, and a lot of that drawn down, carbon dioxide is released back to the atmosphere. That's a straightforward annual cycle. It's perfectly natural, but it's just a wiggle on top of this underlying trend. The underlying trend, the long-term change in carbon dioxide, which is reflected in the long-term change in climate, after uh, in temperature after a lag, uh, is steadily upwards, absolutely remorselessly upwards. And we know that this is due to human activity primarily, primarily the burning of fossil fuels to release carbon dioxide. There's some secondary effects, deforestation and certain industrial processes like manufacturing cement um, also contribute in significant amounts. And there are other greenhouse gases uh, such as methane and nitrous oxide in Ireland, particularly associated with agricultural current agricultural practices. Um, but for today we're talking about the energy system so we're focused on carbon dioxide. And yes, it really is serious. Um, this is a headline from The Guardian uh, last year. Um, it says, climate change will stir unimaginable refugee crisis, says military. So these are not, you know, tree-hugging tree environmentalists um, saying action is necessary in climate change. These are hard-nosed military analysts saying that the destabilization associated with very rapid climate change could easily become systemic and, and trigger uh, major conflict on a uh, first on a local basis but because of the interconnection of global human civilization that could easily um, escalate uh, to wider scale so although we tend to think about the consequences and talk about the consequences of climate change in terms of local impacts like flooding sea level rise extreme weather the kinds of things we've seen here in Ireland in the last couple of weeks. And those are si significant. I wouldn't want to downplay them. But Ireland is in a temperate uh, climatic zone. So other things being equal, we can expect to see sort of middle range climate effects on local climate here in Ireland. They'll be serious. They'll be significant. We need to adjust to them. They'll be much worse in certain other places, not as bad in other places. But if those local uh, impacts were all we had to worry about, maybe a focus on adaptation primarily would make sense. But we are completely exposed to these systemic effects on a global basis, and we can't separate ourselves from them, and they potentially are much more significant. And the thing is that physics isn't political. Uh, there, there, there's no, we can't negotiate with the laws of physics, you can't negotiate with climate change. All we can do is act physically, and at the moment we are acting physically by taking sequestered carbon, carbon that was drawn down out of the atmosphere millions of years ago by plants, and through a series of transformations got buried in the crust of the earth in stable forms where it has lain 
for millions of years. We've located it, we're digging it out at a huge uh, rate that, that is having planetary impact and burning it and putting it into the atmosphere. This, this is, again is a graph of temperature over a shorter period of time now, just going back to the 1950s, the middle of the last century. But the significance about this graph focusing on the recent term, so the UNFCCC, the International Framework Convention on Climate Action, was originally signed in 1992. So supposedly we've been cognizant on a global level of the seriousness of this problem and the need to take rapid action for 20 going on 30 years. And yet the temperature trend is inexorable. In, in fact, mm, while there's some natural variability that, uh, that we have to look through here, but if anything, uh, it is probably accelerating rather than decelerating. So while we've had an awful lot of talk, aspiration, rhetoric, commitments, and everything else over the past 20 to 30 years, these have not translated into commensurate action, into action at a scale that would actually make the problem manageable. And that brings us me to our to my last slide on the science of climate change or the understanding of the climate change problem. And this is about the role of time and how little of it we have. So this is a carbon countdown clock. Essentially the problem is for CO2, uh, it's different for other greenhouse gases, um, but for CO2, carbon dioxide, it's a very long-lived pollutant in the atmosphere. So in the same way as, you know, for an audience like today concerned with uh, nuclear power and the dangers of nuclear power and the dangers of nuclear waste, which is very, very long lived and could escape into the wider environment or into the atmosphere. And of course, those are legitimate concerns. But carbon dioxide is a pollutant just as much, just because it's colorless and odorless and is slower in its impact. Its aggregate impact is potentially much worse. In fact, its aggregate impact is already much more severe than all the nuclear accidents and all the nuclear leakage that has happened since humanity started exploiting nuclear power for civilian purposes. Um, so it's a very long-lived gas. It stays, the bulk, well, a substantial fraction of it stays in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years. So once we put it up there, um, that significant fraction still stays there. And that fraction determines essentially how warm the planet will get. Not immediately, it's a big planet, it takes a few decades to catch up with the atmospheric concentration, but once we put that carbon dioxide in the air, we're committing to a certain amount of warming. And in terms of what have been assessed through a process of scientific analysis and political examination through the UN uh, international process, what has been assessed is that a temperature increase over the pre-industrial temperature of about two degrees is likely to have very damaging impacts on a widespread basis. So, so much so that the Paris Agreement signed in 2015 commits all the signatory nations uh, to limiting the temperature rise to well below two degrees over pre-industrial and take efforts to try to limit it to no more than 1.5 degrees. And that means there's a limit to how much more carbon dioxide we can put in the atmosphere, and we can calculate that limit. There's some uncertainties about it, but basically we can calculate that limit. So you read this diagram like a clock, like it's 100 years, as if we had 100 more years of burning fossil fuels, if we could go all the way around this clock. And now you pick a temperature target. Well, Paris says two degrees, but as I say, there's a degree of uncertainty in exactly how much warming we get for a certain amount of carbon dioxide. So the Paris Agreement says we want to stay well below two degrees. Well, a, a very minimal interpretation of that would be we want at least a two-thirds chance, a two-thirds probability of staying below two degrees. Well, if that's your target and you keep on globally burning fossil fuels at the current rate, then we have only about 19 years. Well, actually it's less than that. This clock dates from the start of last year. So only about 18 years from today. In fact, global emissions went up slightly last year. Um, if you take seriously the Paris Agreement language around 1.5 degrees, say we want to have at least a 50-50 chance of limiting uh, 
to uh, 1.5 degrees then we've only got eight years well in fact seven years from the start of this year left at current emissions levels so we don't have very much time we have maybe 20 to 30 years at the most generous to take dramatic radical action it would have been much better much much better if we'd been taking radical action 20 30 years ago when we originally when the scientists originally diagnosed this problem we didn't and every day that goes by every month that goes by every year that goes by with inadequate action and this is the test it's not enough to take action the action has to be adequate we have to do what's necessary rather than what's convenient and every year that goes by with inadequate action means that the action we then need to take is that much more dramatic that much more radical that much more challenging and that changes everything uh, this understanding of the predicament we're now in and this is my slight uh, argument with the low carbon terminology um, in relation to co2 uh, simply going to a, a lower level of emissions is no longer enough because it continues accumulating in the atmosphere. Even getting to zero, which would stabilize the atmospheric carbon dioxide level, um, zero carbon from zero net carbon between natural processes that it removes it and human processes that are putting it into the atmosphere, even zero carbon is most likely not enough at this stage. We, we, we are likely to overshoot uh, the level of carbon that would be consistent with the temperature targets that give us a chance of managed adaptation I say well below two degrees on a global basis um, so zero carbon is most likely not enough at this stage we're probably going to overshoot that safe level and we need to plan for making significant net removals of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and putting them back into some form of safe storage and we have very little time it's measured in a few decades two to three at the outside to really take decisive action if we squander another two to three decades the opportunity for decisive action will be gone and we will be faced with triage with managing a situation that is uh, on a climb on a global basis rapidly running out of our control um, I, I repeat there are uncertainties in the science but uncertainty is not our friend here because the uncertainty can cut both ways we might get lucky the temperature might not rise quite as fast quite as quickly uh, at our current emissions levels uh, so we might it might transpire that we have an extra decade but we might get unlucky also that's a problem with uncertainty and if we get unlucky then the temperature will rise or the climatic impacts will turn out to be more severe at lower temperatures or we lock in uh, unexpected tipping points in the global system which is very complex um, so uncertainty is not our friend prudential action here means throwing everything at rapidly uh, reducing our emissions particularly of co2 but also of other greenhouse gases and there's a problem here um, there are many problems here of course but one of them is that wider society certainly in the developed world it's in certain very exposed uh, developing countries where they're at the front end of climate impacts this challenge is better understood um, but in many developed countries such as Ireland where we have very high intensity economies in terms of emissions um, we find this terribly terribly inconvenient uh, and by and large the, the majority of citizens are not very much aware that this is an issue it's not appearing very much in public discourse or in the mass media or in political discussions it comes up at intervals and then there's a lot of rhetoric and a lot of hand-wringing and then it goes back into the background and by and large citizens for the moment at least are assuming that this is being looked after it'll work out um, or maybe it's all a hoax or something which is simply not the case of course uh, but who will speak truth to the people because the truth is going to be challenging it may be politically unpalatable but speaking truth to the people is at least as important as speaking truth to power um, so for the politicians listening to this particular presentation and I am not a politician 
Uh, it's an extraordinarily difficult job, so I admire anybody who goes into politics uh, and takes on that task. But politicians, media people, business leaders, this discussion every single day, every single week, we should be discussing this. We should be talking about our inadequate action and talking about how much, how we make our action commensurate to the challenge. Not simply make our action more, but make it commensurate, make it adequate. Okay, so I was asked to talk about an energy system vision for Ireland. So that's what I'm going to move on to. So in formulating a vision uh, for a decarbonized energy system, or ideally a negative carbon energy system, we have various cards we can play, uh, various things we can try, various things we can put into our policy uh, portfolio. So let's put cards on the table. Well, um, nuclear energy is generally a pretty low carbon source of energy. There are lots of other issues with nuclear, but it's a low carbon source. So it is something that one could look to to be uh, a help. But this particular talk was originally delivered to the Nuclear Free Local Authority Forum um, in Ireland, and I respect completely the motivations and interests of the people affiliated with that network, and I completely understand the um, objections to significant build-out of nuclear, particularly in a country like Ireland, where there is no current nuclear power or nuclear reprocessing or nuclear weapons or anything like that. Um, and as I say, I respect that position. All I want to, the only point I want to make here is that if you take that card off the table, then it means you have to make the other cards work so much harder. So there are consequences to deciding that that card is off the table. Fossil fuel with carbon capture and storage, or FFCCS. The idea, basic idea here is that you continue to burn fossil fuels, but you basically <coughs> make them relatively safe by recapturing the carbon dioxide that's generated on combustion uh, and putting it somewhere safe. Somewhere safe typically means pumping it into some sort of secure underground porous rock formation that you can cap off where hopefully it may stay safe for thousands of years or longer. Um, this, is a, this is certainly technically doable. There are examples around the world of this being done uh, and I'll say some more about that in a minute. Bioenergy. Uh, in principle, you grow plants, they suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, then you burn them for energy and the carbon dioxide go back, goes back into the atmosphere. It's a closed loop so it doesn't change the total carbon dioxide concentration. So we can continue to have energy, um, but we're no longer emitting, uh, you know, moving uh, long-term stores of fossilized carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, mm, we'll say some more about that in a minute. But that's just releasing the carbon dioxide on combus combustion of bioenergy back to the atmosphere. There's the things we usually associate uh, with renewable energy, variable renewable energy sources, things like wind and solar, uh, thermal, um, sorry, uh, hydroelectric, uh, wave, tidal, all these kinds of energy sources. And we have particularly rich resources of wind in Ireland, not so great in solar, uh, and the other things need more development. But I'll say more about that in a moment. You can also do bioenergy bio with carbon capture and storage. So um, instead of just capturing CO2 from the atmosphere with your plants and then releasing it back to the atmosphere, when you burn the bioenergy, you could uh, sort of do a combination with what I mentioned earlier for fossil fuel with carbon capture and storage. This is called BEX. It's an interesting idea. It's not running in practice. Uh, bits of it are running in practice, um, but it certainly deserves discussion. Uh, and the last thing, and I've bolded, all the things I've mentioned so far are supply side. Where do we get our low carbon or zero carbon or negative carbon energy from? But the other option, of course, uh, the other card we can have on the table is to reduce how much energy we use. Um, and I think it is important to discuss that also, not to focus exclusively on the supply side. Okay, so let's just briefly run through the pros and cons of those before I tell you my vision for how they might be plugged together. So fossil fuel with carbon capture and storage is low carbon. Um, it's not negative, it's, def it's not zero. You can't capture, recapture, can't feasibly recapture all the CO2 on combustion. Um, but you can certainly capture maybe 90%, uh, which would make a big difference. It would substantially reduce the problem with burning fossil fuels. Um, 
in the case where you're using the fossil fuels to generate electricity, then the electricity is there when you need it. You can have fossil fuel stores uh, and more or less plentiful supply or stocks, and you burn them as you need them. So it's on-demand dispatchable electricity. That's a definite plus. This capture process requires a lot of technology to do it. It's not feasible to do, um, say, in a small home domestic heating boiler. You're burning fossil fuels there, but it's not feasible to recapture the CO2. It's just too expensive to do on a very small scale. Uh, and you need a whole lot of transport then for the CO2 that you've captured. Or for mobile, you know, if, if you're... Uh, burning the fossil fuels, your petrol or diesel in a car engine or your jet fuel in an aeroplane. It's not feasible in those mobile um, applications to recapture the CO2. So this FFCCS idea doesn't work directly uh, for heat energy or transport energy as we currently know it. Uh, and of course doing the capture and compressing and pumping it underground all requires energy as well. So you don't get as much energy out. You've got the so-called parasitic load. And of course you need somewhere to store the CO2, you need to be confident that it's going to stay there, uh, you have to monitor it um, potentially for thousands of years. These are not trivial things. Um, I said you could capture maybe 90% of the CO2 um, associated with for fossil fuel combustion and that is true at the point of combustion. But there's also emissions associated with extracting the fossil fuels, the so-called upstream emissions. Uh, of particular concern there is methane, so anywhere where you're extracting or piping or compressing, transporting uh, natural gas, which is methane is the uh, essential component, natural gas, um, anywhere where you're doing that there's a danger of leakage and natural gas or methane in its own right is a very um, powerful greenhouse gas. So these upstream emissions are problematic. There's also general energy, which is you know, the machinery for excavation and transport and so forth, currently runs on fossil fuels itself. So there's unabated uh, CO2 emissions associated with that as well. So this does limit the effectiveness of, all of these things limit the effectiveness of fossil fuel CCS. And there's also a question mark over public acceptability. Not everybody will be enthusiastic about having carbon dioxide stored under high pressure underneath the ground that they're living on. Uh, it sounds quite scary, uh, probably properly is quite scary. And indeed, in the last 10 years in, in some countries, such as Germany, there has been a pushback against the deployment of fossil, uh, of fossil fuel with carbon capture and storage, partly at least driven by wider societal concerns about the technology. Uh, and then there's the cost. All of the things that I've mentioned represent additional cost over and above the current cost of fossil fuels as people experience. So energy costs would go up. On the other hand, people are, are not perhaps associating the cost of climate impacts and especially the future costs of it, climate impacts that our emissions today are lining up. So in fact, our fossil fuel energy today is not cheap. It's simply that we're not paying the cost today. We're deferring the cost on to future generations or people in poorer parts of the world who are at the front end of climate impacts. But direct costs certainly would go up with this technology. Unabated bioenergy, uh, carbon neutral. That's the story I told. You absorb the CO2 when you grow the plants. You re-release the same CO2 more or less when you burn them. So no net change in atmospheric CO2. Sounds wonderful. Uh, except, of course, it's not true or it's not accurate. It's broadly, there, there, there is a, a germ of truth to it, but the devil is in the details. So uh, growing agricultural crops in general, we use fertilizer, uh, typically nitrogen-based, uh, takes energy typically coming from fossil fuels today to manufacture those nitrogen fertilizers and also their application on the land uh, releases nitrous oxide which again is a uh, strong greenhouse gas in its own right. So you know there are pros and cons here. The machinery that we use for planting, cultivating, harvesting, processing uh, the transport, all of these things use energy as well. So at best, this is parasitic energy. At worst, it has emissions associated with it that we're not actually uh, using the bioenergy to service. Um, there's land use change implications. This is so if we're growing bioenergy crops, then we're not growing something else. 
uh, and, and we talk about direct and indirect land use change, so maybe we change the use of a particular plot of ground, say we cut down tropical rainforest and start growing palm trees for palm oil or something like that, but there's also indirect land use change, um, where if we displace food growing from one place, will that cause the tropic forest to be cut down somewhere else in order to allow f food crops to be planted. So the whole energy uh, food security nexus is very complex and has to be looked at very carefully. So deploying bioenergy has to be done uh, with great care for the direct and indirect impacts that might not have been anticipated. So at best, bioenergy is low carbon, not zero, not negative, uh, unabated bioenergy. Um, and at worst, it might not be noticeably better than fossil fuel use for energy, or might even be worse than fossil fuel energy in certain particular um, situations. On the plus side, uh, we get a fuel. We get biomass, or we get biofuels, or we get biogas, something like that, uh, which is transportable, is storable um, to an extent, depending on the particular form of it. Uh, it can be used in all our current electricity uses, uh, or heat uses, or transport uses, in principle at least. So we don't have to change all our other infrastructure, say for heat or transport, uh, and we may not have to drastically change even some of our electricity infrastructure in order to use bioenergy. And if we use bioenergy for electricity, it's dispatchable. It's, uh, you know, it's there on demand, which again is a big advantage. And it's low carbon on demand electricity. And we have not too many choices for how to get that. And arguably there's a specific Irish indigenous opportunity in bioenergy. We have certain feedstocks already available or that could be made uh, readily available. So food waste is actually a problem in Ireland. There are crop residues that currently have no economic value or very little economic value. Uh, there's waste f from sawmills, there's vegetable oil waste. Things like this can be exploited for bioenergy and if they displace fossil fuels that should reduce net emissions. Um, we don't have that much forestry in Ireland which in turn means in principle at least we have scope to have a lot more forestry and then we could use that for bioenergy but the, there's a lot of question marks around that, not least because the rotation timescale is very long there. You know, we're into multiple decades, 20, 30, 40 years to regrow forest or to grow new forest from scratch. And as I mentioned, our climate change crunch in terms of energy emissions is of that timescale or shorter. Um, so we really need things that kick in faster than that. Short rotation, annual or biannual crop crops, things like miscanthus, willow, uh, grass even, these are possibilities. There are various others. Uh, they're probably a better bet and we have conditions in Ireland that would allow their growth. If we displaced ruminant agriculture systems, um, such as beef, dairy, sheep, because they're responsible for high methane emissions, then we get a kind of a double benefit there. We get bioenergy on the one hand and we reduce a different kind of greenhouse emissions from certain existing land uses. So this is a beneficial land use change potentially in certain cases. Um, uh, there are many different bioenergy use pathways, but if we process to biogas or bio, well, to biomethane in particular, then we can exploit our existing gas network, which is currently fed with natural gas, but we can continue to get value from that uh, gas network and from appliances and so forth that are dependent, uh, investment that's already dependent on the use of gas. So we can extend the use of gas somewhat by bioenergy pathways that uh, generate biomethane. Um, but overall, we have to recognize that there's a very finite potential here. The, the land food nexus, the land use competition, ecological risks, if we start making over huge tracts of land on a global basis to bioenergy crops, um, there will almost certainly be ecological dangers that we haven't anticipated because the systems are so complex. So, for, so the message there is whatever bioenergy we do use, and there probably is a, a role for bioenergy, we need to use it to maximize the climate benefit because it's a finite resource. And then of course there's the cost. Um, it is a more expensive, fo in direct cost terms, is a more expensive form of energy than fossil energy. So our energy costs, as we experience them, would go up uh, with a big shift to bioenergy. On the other hand, um, as I mentioned, we're not experiencing the true costs of fossil energy. Um, so the, uh, 
long-term costs, the cost of future generations. If bioenergy is managed in an appropriate way to ensure it genuinely is yielding lower emissions, and as I say, there's lots of question marks over that, but if it's subject to very, very robust criteria and management uh, and limited exploitation, then it could be a significant contributor. Uh, variable renewable, uh, variable intermittent renewables, things like wind, solar, uh, they are low carbon, arguably very low carbon, but again, you won't get to zero and you won't get to negative. Why not to zero? I mean, when the wind is blowing and a wind turbine is turning, there's no fuel being burnt, there's no CO2 emissions there, so how how is it not zero? Well, the reason is that there are embedded emissions associated with the construction of that wind turbine and everything that goes with it, the transmission lines and the cables and the machinery and so forth. So the concrete, the steel, uh, the manufacturing processes, all of that currently involve emissions and uh, they essentially mean that over its lifetime, a wind turbine we build today is not quite carbon zero, uh, certainly not carbon negative. But still, it's a lot lower uh, than fo unabated fossil fuels, certainly. Um, the technologies we currently have directly only give us electricity. Um, so they don't directly allow us to address the other two big sectors of our energy use, heat and transport. So we would have to think about how much, how big a part of the picture these variable renewables can play. And it's a feast or famine thing. That's what we mean by saying they're variable. When the wind is blowing, great. But when the wind isn't blowing, which it can do in Ireland for days or even weeks at a time, then you've got a problem. You've got this feast or famine issue. And we currently, although there's a lot of work going on and storage technologies and people uh, wax lyrical about battery technology and how rapidly the costs are coming down, but they're not coming down nearly rapidly enough to make seasonal timescale storage of large amounts of energy in electrical form or chem electrochemical form in batteries really realistic and again we don't we can't wait for half a century of technological development we have to deploy what we can deploy today and there's the question of public acceptability uh, or support for wind in ireland uh, there has for very understandable reasons been a reaction against it in many parts of ireland uh, onshore wind um, and it certainly is becoming progressively more difficult to gain community trust uh, and community acceptance and support for onshore wind projects. And, and that, you know, as I say, I think many mistakes were made. Some lessons have been learned, but there's work to be done to regain public trust uh, that this really is an important uh, thing we can do. Offshore wind exploitation is probably easier and costs are certainly coming down and Ireland has really uh, a wonderful offshore wind resource uh, to draw on. Uh, in terms of our indigenous energy resources, um, in principle that resource is the most <coughs> readily accessible one uh, that can make the biggest contribution in the few decades time scale that we have to take really strong action in my opinion. There's also public acceptance of transmission lines. Uh, most of the people at this forum will be aware of the controversy around just the north-south electrical interconnector, which is not directly about renewable energy. It's only very indirectly about renewable energy. But the opposition to that infrastructure build-out uh, is indicative of waning social acceptance for that big infrastructure. Um, but re-engineering our electricity system to have much more variable intermittent renewables as part of it will necessarily mean significant, some significant re-engineering of transmission and distribution infrastructure as well. And we will need to gain public support for that if it's to happen. Cost is an issue, um, and you'll all be aware that costs have declined, and there's a lot of talk about how wind and solar are now cheaper than nuclear or cheaper even than fossil fuels in certain circumstances, and so it's a no-brainer to switch to these things. And there is a strong element of truth in that, but it's not the whole truth. So I want to give you the big caveat on that story. Uh, I'll quote this from a recent book by Heinberg and Fridley. They say, engineers will certainly make every effort to adapt new energy resources to familiar usage patterns. We can, to a certain limited extent, press solar and wind into the mould of our current energy system by buffering their variability with energy storage technology and grid enhancements. So the point here is that feast or famine, use it or lose it, variable energy 
sources are not plug-in replacements for our traditional dispatchable electricity sources. Okay, so we have to do something extra to work them into that mold. Anyway, to continue the quote. But the larger the proportion of our total energy we get from these resources, the variable resources, the more our buffering efforts will cost us in both money and energy. Past 60 to 80 percent, the need for storage and redundancy will likely explode. It doesn't just go up linearly the more of these you use. At a certain point, you know, is it 40 percent, 50 percent, 60 percent? But as you uh, push to very high penetrations of these variable renewables, then the integration costs the costs of managing their variability rises very, very rapidly. <coughs> so finally, the goal of a near 100% variable renewable grid-based electricity system is a subject of great controversy and research, but it remains theoretical. Okay, so it's very unclear how far we can go. Um, but it's also clear that we can go quite a long way. Okay, so this is a uh, caution about assuming we can get to 100% or even nearly 100% just from these variable intermittent renewables um, and caution about the costs. As we push to progressively higher levels of integration, the costs will go up significantly despite the cost reductions that, and, and they're great, um, but the cost reductions that we've experienced, but to some extent we may be moving into the territory of diminishing returns on those reductions, for, certainly for the more established variable uh, renewables, particularly wind and solar. Okay, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, we've already talked about uh, bioenergy, but the big change with this is that if when we burn the bioenergy uh, or combust it, if we recapture the carbon dioxide, well then maybe we can get to net carbon negative because the plants, as they grew to carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, if we don't release that back to the atmosphere, but instead bury it deep underground or something like that, uh, then maybe we can actually get net drawdown of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But it all depends. As I mentioned, the carbon balance even for unabated bioenergy is depends on the details of the particular bioenergy pathway. So whether you'll actually get to carbon negative, um, the devil is in the details. But there is no doubt that combining bioenergy <coughs> use with carbon capture and storage will do significantly better than unabated bioenergy use. So as I mentioned earlier, the bioenergy resource is going to be very finite and limited. And we want to be careful about expanding it too rapidly or to too great a scale. So we want to get the maximum carbon benefit from that. So using it in pathways that allow carbon capture and storage will certainly get the maximum climate benefit from that bioenergy resource. And the good thing is, uh, although, again, because of the CCS constraint to large fixed plant, not small boilers or small uh, internal combustion engines on vehicles, um, realistically, the primary use for uh, BECS bioenergy with carbon uh, capture storage would be for electricity generation or maybe for large-scale heat and industrial processes but not for domestic heat directly or for transport um, so that's a limitation but it is dispatchable unlike the variable intermittence so maybe there's a complementary role here that the variable intermittence which as I say are have a penetration limit maybe 50 percent maybe 60 percent maybe 80 percent um, but certainly a penetration limit there so bioenergy as a dispatchable resource could help complement the variable uh, renewables. Um, but the usable resource remains highly constrained. Uh, and this all relies on proving carbon capture and storage. And we only have small demonstrators really running in the world at the moment. And that also links back to the cost uh, of BECs in general and the cost of carbon capture and storage. We need to actually deploy carbon capture and storage at scale to find out really what the costs are and more to the point to drive those costs down by learning from the experience of deploying it. Uh, I'll just mention on the side here again the audience for this forum will be familiar with the so-called renewable heat incentive scandal in Northern Ireland um, where it turned out that due to the design of the scheme it, it, far from being beneficial for climate, uh, it, it led to the so-called cash for ash sort of practices where people, uh, it is suggested, were burning um, bioenergy fuels not for any actual heat benefit, but just because they could get more through the incentive scheme, more get paid more through the incentive scheme than they had to pay for the fuel. 
So simply burning bioenergy uh, fuels and throwing away the heat or using it very inefficiently was a profitable enterprise due to the poor design of the scheme. Um, but that's the RHI scandal. I want to talk about a deeper scandal. Uh, so the EU Renewable Energy Directive is not currently aligned with strong climate mitigation, even though what we, you know, if you read the documentation from the Commission, they'll say it absolutely is. But the problem is that within the EU definition of renewable, not all renewables are low carbon, and not all low carbon renewables, uh, uh, sorry, not all low carbon energy sources actually qualify as renewable under the Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, essentially, all bioenergy is treated as renewable, even though, as I've described, without very, very strong safeguards or constraints or limits, the climate benefit um, may be very limited. So the current discussion at EU level to aim for significantly higher renewable energy penetration across the European Union has to be interpreted through this lens. Unless there are really, really strong safeguards on how much of that is delivered by bioenergy to ensure that there are net climate benefits, um, then it could actually be problematic simply to drive renewable energy penetration higher. Uh, and you know, the difficulty there is uh, that the devil is in the details, and certainly a lot of scientific opinion that I've seen suggests that the current cautions being considered at EU level, at the Commission level, are not adequate to meet these requirements. Um, the net effect of the Renewable Energy Directive and these high penetrations is that that unabated bioenergy use is essentially prioritised as an energy strategy. Unabated bioenergy, um, even though we know that in some cases that could actually be worse than unabated fossil fuel reduction, and certainly could quite commonly be worse than abated fossil fuel, fossil fuels with CCS, uh, or especially bioenergy with CCS. But the current incentive schemes uh, are tending to have th that effect that because they don't distinguish the real climate benefit of different bioenergy schemes or different renewable schemes, uh, in many cases it turns out that the cheapest form of renewable is bioenergy for heat uh, in relatively small scale applications where there's no possibility of abating it, no possibility of CCS, uh, and there aren't good controls of the overall emissions and the pathways. So naive promotion of unabated bioenergy, especially with multi-decade lock-in of infrastructure, so you incentivize the installation of capital plant and equipment for burning bioenergy that is a lifetime measured in decades. So it's locking in this um, not well constrained approach to energy to make sure that it contributes to climate benefit and you're locking it in for multiple decades when we, have very li we don't have multiple decades to play with. So that's a highly questionable climate policy. Um, but that kind of thing, building out unabated bioenergy, is precisely the expected intended effect of the current renewable heat incentive uh, in Northern Ireland and in the UK and the planned incentive for the Irish Republic, as I've understood it presented. Um, and that is a concern. And I think it's scandalous and it doesn't get talked about nearly enough. But back to the main line. Um, I mentioned consumption reduction. There are various ways of doing that, in principle at least. But we need to talk about really deep consumption reductions. One method uh, was actually developed in the UK um, 10, 15 years ago. In fact, the origins date back about 20 years. A system called Tradable Energy Quotas, or TEX. The link there is to a document I submitted to the Republic of Ireland Citizens Assembly when they were discussing climate action. Uh, it gives details on that. But basically, it's a way of applying a cap on how much energy we collectively use and having a system for arranging fair shares or rationing of it. So that would be a policy instrument that now people still have complete choice in how they go about achieving those reductions, but at the collective level the reductions have to be achieved. They will be achieved confidently, with confidence, and that's what we need in our policy now. It's things that will actually deliver with confidence. Um, Aviation is a big uh, controversial area of energy use because it is so emissions intensive. Flying an airplane, uh, especially first class, is probably the single most emissions intensive activity that any human being can engage in. And it is engaged in hugely inequitably in terms of the global population. 
population, only a relatively tiny segment of the global population, use aeroplanes regularly. So they are disproportionately contributing uh, to the climate problem. Um, so the, the link there, a free ride to org, uh, dot org, is to a campaign for a way to approach that, not to eliminate air travel in the short term, um, but to certainly reduce it significantly, constrain it significantly, uh, and make access to it much fairer. Uh, and I think that's a very reasonable thing to suggest and at least talk about. Of course, there are efficiency measures, um, so much better insulation on our houses and buildings and public buildings and businesses and so forth. Cogeneration or combined heat and power can also be an important contributor to more efficient use of energy and, and less use of energy sources for our energy services. But whenever we talk about efficiency, we have to be aware of rebound or Jevons paradox. So efficiency is often sold on the basis that it will save money. The problem with that is that if you save money, uh, most people wind up spending, or organisations as the case may be, wind up spending that money on something else. And that something else may well involve emissions. And if it involves as much or more emissions as the original thing uh, that the efficiency measure got rid of, then we're no better off and might even be worse off. So you need some combination of something like tradable emissions quotas with efficiency to ensure that you actually get the benefit of the efficiency, that you actually see emissions consistently coming down through those efficiency measures. So efficiency measures on their own are of, what shall we say, dubious value, questionable value. It's hard to be confident about the climate benefits of them. Um, so they need to be part of a package that includes top-down limits on how much energy will be used and or how much emissions will be allowed. We have some mechanisms that claim to do that, um, but I, as you saw earlier, their practical effectiveness, the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere tells a different story at the moment. So finally, uh, I've, I've shown you what cards are on the table. Where do I come out? This is going to be a qualitative presentation of a vision there's a lot of detail here and everything I say here is contestable. So this is my personal opinion. I'm speaking in a personal capacity um, and all of it is contestable and I invite contestation. Okay, But based on everything I've said, my first priority would be to reduce absolute energy consumption in a fair manner and to keep on doing it deeper and deeper. Everything else from a technological point of view is much, much easier if the total energy demand is going down. Much easier than if it's continuing to go up. Okay, so this makes everything much easier. Furthermore, you don't intrinsically have to build new infrastructure to reduce absolute energy consumption, and you can do it much faster. And because we're now down to just a few decades for effective action, in the very short term, in the next decade, um, reducing absolute energy consumption really uh, could and should be, in my opinion, front and centre. For local authorities, Things you might particularly focus on, smart, shared mobility, uh, shared urban mobility, so getting rid of single passenger cars or even two passenger cars, uh, that kind of thing. Much greater emphasis on things like cycling, uh, you know, cycling not just for leisure, I mean that's fine as a hobby, but the main point here is not cycling for leisure, but cycling for instrumental purposes, actually displacing uh, motorised transport. Um, Spatial planning to support that, walkable environments. I'd love to see a network, I'm speaking uh, to the Nuclear Free Local Authorities Network, I'd love to be speaking to the Aviation Free Local Authorities Network. I think that would be a very interesting um, catalyst for change if local authorities said, unless and until aviation can be made uh, zero carbon, and the proposals at the moment really don't add up on that, then they would not uh, participate in supporting aviation infrastructure or that kind of thing. That's just one example. Um, I said that things like fossil fuel CCS or BEX, bioenergy with CCS, or indeed the variable renewables uh, only directly address the electricity sector. They don't really address the heating and transport sectors, which today are just as big as the electricity sector. Um, but one way to circumvent that is to electrify heating and transport. So we're familiar with electric cars, obviously. Heat pumps for uh, electric heating uh, have come on technologically in leaps and bounds in the last decade or so. Uh, so electrifying heating and electrifying transport uh, 
to the maximum extent possible would allow us to move those energy demands away from those relatively inflexible fuel-based usages into electricity where we have much more flexibility about how they're served. Um, aggressively retrofit carbon capture and storage wherever that is feasible. So where we have existing infrastructure that's using fossil fuels where it is f technically feasible to capture the carbon dioxide and put it into storage, let's just do that. Uh, it means we immediately reduce the emissions from those existing plants within their current lifetime. So we don't just let them run at their current emission levels for the rest of their lifetime. We cut them back early as quickly as we can. Um, and it also allows us to get experience in deploying CCS and drive down the costs. Uh, and I'll mention why we want that in a minute. Um, aggressively build out whatever is our most favourable indigenous variable or uh, renewable energy. And in my opinion, for the UK and Ireland, that is primarily wind. That's our best indigenous resource in the short term that we can we have the technology to deploy at greater levels. And I know some people say we've focused too much on wind. Um, I My personal view is we haven't. We can do a lot more and we should do a lot more. We need to do a lot more and it has the obvious uh, side effect of uh, dramatically enhancing our energy security. Uh, certainly in Ireland uh, and in Britain, island, uh, geographic islands reliant on international trade but Ar the island of Ireland especially heavily reliant uh, for our energy on imports the more we can max out uh, on indigenous completely indigenous energy supplies the better for our long-term security particularly in an insecure progressively insecure climate damaged uh, global uh, environment and as I said although the costs do potentially uh, escalate very rapidly as you go to very high concentrations getting up to 60 percent it appears to be very very doable and if we were at the same time aggressively electrifying heating and transport well then we still have a lot more variable renewable to bring on stream before we'll be at 60 percent of a fully electrified energy system so certainly for the next decade two decades we could build out um, wind. A certain amount of solar, there's a niche for it, but it's it's not, in my view, technically uh, as attractive right now um, as, as deploying uh, wind. We should deploy bioenergy, but very cautiously, only with direct verifiable climate benefits. So things like the indigenous waste feedstocks, short rotation crops, displacing ruminant agriculture system. And we should keep the door open to seasonal storage, uh, so pathways for bioenergy that would support uh, essentially uh, moving energy from summer to winter, winter to summer, or whatever, uh, being able to keep energy in store for, uh, for the time when the variable renewables are not available, or ultimately for doing bioenergy with CCS. And these factors strongly favour, um, in my view, methane-based bioenergy pathways via anaerobic digestion or gasification of biomass materials. Um, the final fossil fuel gap, the bit, the dispatchable bit that is still left after we've gone to 60% variable renewables and we've done some prudent bioenergy uh, deployment, then large-scale storage. So we deploy even more variable renewables and we use to synthesize something like methane, so synthetic natural gas, power to grid, along with large-scale methane storage. Something like that, it may not, you know, there may be a role for hydrogen, there may be um, methanol, there may be other fuel types that we go to there. These things have relatively low energy efficiency, um, so, you know, the, the costs are still going up, but they are ways of getting rid of the final fossil fuel usages from our energy system and they are feasible the technologies are fairly well understood and because time is now so short so short we can't wait for new technologies and and we should be acting now looking towards carbon negative going beyond zero emissions from the energy system um, so strategic deployment of forest but leaving it in place so building up timber carbon stocks not cutting them down uh, not harvesting forestry planting forests and leaving them alone for at least decades, multiple decades, unless we're sure that if they're harvested and burnt that they'll be going into a carbon capture and storage pathway. Direct air carbon capture I haven't mentioned, but 
if if we can have excess uh, energy, low carbon energy supplies, then we can directly extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, there are other techniques, enhanced weathering, that we can also look towards. And again, for this particular audience, I know you want to take the nuclear card off the table, but these things are hard and time is not on our side. And so I'll simply leave it with you that it may be appropriate um, because of the challenge, because of the existential challenge of climate change, um, notwithstanding all the things to object to, and I object to them with nuclear energy, simply saying that it should play no role at all, I'm not sure is ideal either. Um, okay, I was asked to say something about Brexit. I'll say something about Brexit. Please don't. Um, I, I know that sounds silly and um, facile, um, but it, it is not absolutely impossible to move back from Brexit uh, here in March 2018. So I, um, it's a serious suggestion, and I'm saying it from the point of view of a European citizen. Um, the UK has delivered huge leadership at EU level in climate and energy policy over the past 15, 20 years. Not quite as much in the last few years, um, but historically the UK has been hugely influential in articulating a vision of high ambition on climate and energy at the European level. That voice will be sorely missed um, with a, you know, a hard Brexit scenario. Uh, and if any way can be found to come back from that, I, I, you know, speaking as a European citizen, um, I, I think that would be highly desirable. A parting thought. I'll read this. This is from another uh, American climate scientist, Kate Marvel. Uh, you can see the headline there, we need courage, not hope, to face climate change. She says, as a climate scientist, I am often asked to talk about hope. Particularly in the current political climate, audiences want to be told that everything will be all right in the end. And unfortunately, I have a deep-seated need to be liked and a natural tendency to optimism that leads me to accept more speaking invitations than is good for me. Climate change is bleak, the organisers always say. Tell us a happy story. Give us hope. The problem is, I don't have any. And I can really empathise with that. And I know this is a very difficult message, um, but I want to say that in a strange way, hope is the enemy now. Or at least, hope that isn't founded on realistic action, commensurate action. The current way we have of talking about the climate problem is mainly about, well, what's feasible for us to do? What's affordable for us to do? But that's no longer the question we need to ask. The question we need to ask is, what is necessary for us to do? What is commensurate with the risks that we are already running and the rate at which we are rapidly increasing those risks? And hope doesn't help with that. What helps with that, I think, is courage. We have to be brave in talking to each other and talking to our politicians uh, and talking to other people in vulnerable parts of the world uh, and talking to other people who are very high emitters, even higher than we are here in Ireland. We need the courage to speak truth. We need the courage to take to make hard, difficult actions that are necessary to protect our children, their children, everybody's children. Uh, and uh, I mean, I say children, anybody today under 40 is going to be faced with uh, very, very serious impacts, I expect, from this unravelling climate system we have. Okay. In closing then, I want to acknowledge the AINETS project. This is a research project funded by the Irish Environment Protection Agency. Uh, it's looking into the potential for negative emissions technologies in Ireland. I've given you the website there. If anybody wants to read more about that, there's my email address one last time in case anybody wants to follow up with me. I'm very happy to receive emails. If you want to query uh, any of this, uh, the slides, the slide uh, that I've just been running through there. It has had things highlighted in green like that, which are typically links that are clickable in the PDF. And if you go to this site, you'll be able to find uh, a copy of that PDF if you want to. Um, so you can click through uh, and follow those for more information. Thank you very much for your patience. As I say, this is an extended version. Uh, in OMA, I only had about 20 minutes, so I've obviously taken a bit longer to expand on the points but I hope you've enjoyed it.